fresh meat. Everything's true. God's an astronaut. Oz is over the rainbow. The Midians, where the monsters live. Fans demanding a new cut of a movie has gotten quite in vogue these days. Zack Snyder started something that seems to just keep snowballing. But long before fans of Snyder were shouting to release the Snyder cut, there were fans of Clive Barker shouting, Occupy Midian. They yearned to dive into the world they'd only caught glimpses of in 1990. Today on What the F*** Happened to This Horror Movie, we're seeing what became of Clive Barker's Nightbreed. Clive Barker is a legend in the horror world. His stories of the macabre have inspired a generation and are still being adapted to this day. Hellraiser and Hellbound Hellraiser 2 were journeys into, well, hell, and felt unlike anything else at the time. Still fascinated by the world of monsters, and shortly wrapping up Hellbound, Barker turned his attention towards his novella, Cabal. Cabal is a story of Boone, a man from Calgary struggling with his mental health. It doesn't help that his therapist Decker is out there murdering people and placing the blame on him. This culminates in Boone being killed only for him to rise from the dead as a monster. It's Clive Barker, so you had to expect monsters at some point. Boone struggles with his new life while his old life tries catching up with him. He takes refuge in the land of the Nightbreed, the city of Midian. The monsters are hidden outcasts who are just trying to survive. Boone's presence shines a spotlight on their existence and could disrupt everything. That story sounds pretty cool, right? Monsters is the heroes of the story instead of the villains? Well, don't get used to it because it's about to go through some changes. I want to thank you guys for watching What the F*** Happened to This Horror Movie and ask that if you enjoy our shows, please subscribe to our channel right now, like this video, and click on the bell so you can be notified each time a new video goes up. And now, back to the show. Morgan Creek Productions greenlit the film, and like in the original Hellraiser, Barker took on directing duties, hoping his prior successes would give him enough creative freedom. He also brought along many of his Hellraiser cohorts, such as Doug Bradley, Simon Bamford, and Nicholas Vince. Having played Cenobites, their new role found them as the Monsters of Midian. While the studio pushed for a name actor, Craig Sheffer was cast as the lead, Boone. He does a great job with what amounts to a very difficult role. He's an everyman that goes through extraordinary circumstances and really acts as the audience surrogate. His love for his girlfriend Lori, played by Ann Bobby, plays a central role in the story. He refuses the rules of Midian in order to be with her. Their relationship is really the core of the story. Trying to screw up everything is Boone's therapist, Decker, played by David Cronenberg. Yes, that David Cronenberg. Needless to say, the cast is unique. But production on Nightbreed wasn't an easy one. For years, the film held the Guinness World Record for most monsters on screen. And this was long before the days of CGI. This meant that each of the monster's makeup had to be applied practically by an artist. With a budget of $11 million and shooting on Pinewood Studios right next to Tim Burton's Batman, the pressure was on. So it's not really surprising that Morgan Creek had executives on set to monitor them. But as you might expect, this wasn't met with enthusiasm from any of the crew. Higher-ups didn't understand how the monsters could be the heroes, and instead wanted a more black and white approach. They brought Decker's masked alter ego back to kill a few more people, lending to the new direction they were wanting to go in. And they entirely replaced Doug Bradley's vocal performance with that of some German guy. While Bradley says the decision wasn't done in malice, I think it was simply that they were saying to me, we need to ADR all your lines, and we're not about to fly you across the Atlantic. It's just another one of the more baffling creative decisions made here. One of the few bright spots in the film released to theaters is the hip music. Hot off scoring Tim Burton's Batman, young composer Danny Elfman provides a really fun score to the proceedings. It makes the film feel large in scope despite its lower budget. 
Plenty of Elfman's trademark musical flourishes exist here, and it really impresses. When Nightbreed released in the United States on February 16, 1990, the marketing pushed a very different story than the one from Cabal. Instead of a tale of hidden outcasts worried their world will crumble, it was instead treated as a world of scary monsters that want to hurt you. Clive Barker, creator of Hellraiser, brings you a reason to really be afraid of the dark. They were clearly just trying to ride high off of Clive's name. The worst part is, they didn't consult Barker on any of these marketing changes. When he caught wind, he was furious, claiming the execs didn't understand the movie he was trying to make. Which is true. One of the Morgan Creek execs is said to only have watched the beginning of the film and ordered cuts based on brief footage he saw. So instead the movie was retooled as a slasher, with more focus on David Cronenberg's villain Decker. They wanted to market to the lowest common denominator, and in their minds, that meant a slasher movie. But it was more than just marketing that changed. There are actually four different versions of Nightbreed that exist. The theatrical cut, the Cabal cut, the extended VHS cut, and the director's cut. The Cabal and director's cut are the most similar, with quality being the main difference, as Cabal was made using old VHSs of the work print. But there's still plenty of content missing between the two versions. Even when compared to a work print, the theatrical version is easily the messiest. Worried the film would never sell as Barker's original vision, executives cut up the film and excised nearly 40 minutes of footage. They retooled the story into some weird slasher, and all the wonderful nuances and heavy themes were relegated to the background, or disappeared entirely. They cut out loads of monsters and managed to lose any sense of originality. Given how many changes there are, we'll take this one at a time. We've already gone over the sloppy slasher film that the theatrical cut turned into. This version can be found on DVD and has been mostly wiped away from streaming services. It's the shortest version, and with good reason. It doesn't make any sense. The relationships between the Nightbreed are practically non-existent, and Boone and Laurie's connection is whittled down to nothing. Decker is at the center of the story, and even comes back Jason-style in the end. It feels like they were just trying to check the box of what a horror movie should be without really liking horror in the first place. The extended VHS cut is the longest version of the film that exists. Though despite its length, it's also missing a significant amount of polish. Audio cuts out, some scenes are left unscored, characters are killed multiple times, and some moments are shown more than once. Since this is the original work print, it doesn't have a lot of the finishing touches, and it wasn't cut for pacing, so the film is a bit of a slog to get through. This version was originally shown at Horror Hound Weekend in 2009 to a group of diehard fans. This spurred on the next version, the Cabal Cut. Having missed out on the Horror Hound screening, Russell Sherrington borrowed a copy of the extended VHS cut to see it for himself. Over the course of the next two years, Russell combined the old VHS footage and the Nightbreed DVD to create the Cabal Cut. He followed the second shooting draft, as well as the novella itself in order to cut it into a more cohesive story, finishing the audio and removing the repeated scenes. Finally, we have the Director's Cut. This came about after years of screening the Cabal Cut at various fan events and ultimately proving to Morgan Creek that it would be worth the money to fund the restoration. So they allowed Mark Miller and Andrew Furtado to edit the new footage together from the original film negative. They were guided by Clive Barker and released both a limited edition as well as a standard release for their director's cut. This is the most complete version of the film out there. Decker takes more of a backseat and the monsters are treated less like villains. Doug Bradley gets his voice back and his character actually seems to care about the events unfolding. Boone and Laurie's relationship returns to the forefront, with the film even ending on Boone turning Laurie into a nightbreed, so they can be together forever. The prophecy has been fulfilled, and Boone can lead the nightbreed to a new home. It's an improvement in just about every way. One major character fate that changes is that of Narcissus, who Barker had killed off in his original story. 
test audiences really hated this, as Narciss was most people's favorite character. Not a surprise given Hugh Ross's zany performance. I only wanted to keep her warm. So producers reinserted Narciss into the final battle and wiped away his death, even as a touching scene with Boone at the end. This is one of the only things that could possibly be considered good about the theatrical cut. But since Narciss died in the original story, his death was reinserted for the director's cut. It means we miss out on the Boone reunion, which is a nice moment, but killing off Narciss showed the stakes of the final battle, so it's hard to argue against it. It shouldn't be a surprise that a film about a group of monsters hiding away from normal society has connected to so many outcasts. The marginalization of the Nightbreed could be compared to the treatment of many different minority groups. The themes are very poignant, and it does a good job of showing the viewer that while you may have been told they were monsters, you can see that they're just like you. It's touching. But that message is kind of lost depending on the version you watch. Fan interest in Nightbreed extended past the film itself, with two video games based on it being released on the Commodore 64. First, there was Nightbreed the Action Game, which was, surprise surprise, an action game that loosely followed the events of the movie. The second was Nightbreed the Interactive Movie, and it's exactly what you think it is. You know, they're really on the nose with their labeling for these games. While neither game will exactly blow you away, it's a testament for how well-loved the world is. And that's even with the bastardized form that we were given theatrically. We also received a comic book series from Epic Comics that ran for 25 issues before being cancelled. The story more closely followed the director's cut and even extended beyond the ending of the movie. Thankfully, with Clive Barker, as well as many cast members voicing their displeasure, fans were finally able to see the version of the film promised to them all those years ago. The legacy of Nightbreed is as alive as ever. When Shout Factory released the director's cut in 2014, they settled years of debate as to whether the Cabal cut would make up for the film that Fox released. And with 40 minutes of entirely new footage, it's a completely different movie. And boy does it look good. Packed with special features, you can dive into even more of the history of this cult classic. It's an absolute must for fans of the film. Morgan Creek Entertainment has been trying to get a Nightbreed TV series off the ground since 2014. In 2018, they partnered with Sci-Fi and brought in Josh Stolberg to write and Michael Doherty to direct. Unfortunately, the status of this project is unknown and hasn't been heard from in a while. So even if we are never able to return to the world of Midian, I'm grateful that Clive Barker was given the chance to bring us the journey as he originally intended because sometimes the monsters deserve a second chance. His name is Cabal. He... Under me, Midian. <laughs>